these live stream series of conversations with artists that don't fit in a box. For those of you who may not know, Golden Thread is the first American theater company devoted to plays from or about the Middle East. We are based in San Francisco and are currently celebrating our 25th anniversary, which is very exciting. Today, I'm very delighted to welcome uh, our lovely artists who are with us, Jamil Khoury, co-founder of Silk Road Rising in Chicago, John Eisner, who is the founding artistic director of The Lark and is currently in his first year of retirement, which is very exciting, and Taran Jagazarian, our dear founding artistic director of Golden Thread. And our conversation today is about the Middle East America Initiative, which was a national new plays program. And I'm here to help us all learn more about it and its inception. And I would just love to know where actually the idea was born between the three of you. Go ahead. Whoever wants to take that question <laughs> and go for it. Your three are very eloquent. So. I think we each have a different memory of how it was born. Uh, we were just talking about this, and my memory is uh, Yusuf El Gindi, who at the time, who's an Egyptian American playwright and has had a long history with Golden Thread. He was at the time working with all three companies. He had a play being developed at the Lark. He had something coming up at Silk Road Rising, and he had been produced at Golden Thread for a number of years. Um, so he suggested that the three companies come together and develop some kind of national partnership to support Middle Eastern American playwrights. Um, and, and yeah, John, you were just saying that the Lark also had a Middle East uh, diaspora initiative at the time. Um, yeah, no, I, I think we, you, one of the words that I've been thinking a lot about lately uh, that Jamil has introduced me to is this notion of polyculturalism. And I think that that sm small communities, meaning theater companies like ours in different parts of the country, have our own culture of what it means to create platforms for voices. And so I think we all have very different histories coming into this initiative and what the beauty and power of the initiative is over practically two de decades is, is that it's created some sense of, uh, of uh, order and coordination around some voices that the three of us have been able to agree were important uh, voices to be heard. And you know, you, what I, we, in the pre-show talk, we were talking a little, trying to re recall how it all began. And I do know that we have a Playwrights Week program that is a general open admission, uh, open uh, submissions program for many, many people. And uh, modeled after that, we created a South Asian diaspora program uh, for a number of years at the request of the Indo-American Arts Council. And then we got to know Yusuf because Yusuf was part of the, the, the that um, Playwrights Week program. Um, and other, other folks in the Middle East diaspora community, and they asked if there could be more space. And so we put it into the Playwrights uh, Week format at first as part of a, a, a sort of a, a, a structured conversation around those voices. And really the, the most important outcome was a, a conversation in 2006 that Taraj and Catherine Correa co-facilitated that uh, brought together people from many, many different backgrounds in the Middle East diaspora. In fact, I just remember there are people sitting next to each other who actually spoke about how they never thought they would sit next to another person of that different personality. <laughs> mm, and yeah. it was very moving. And talk about safe spaces. It was a it was a complicated and challenging circle to be in. But what was really clear in that circle was the problem, which is that there weren't spaces where people could find their own voices, where they didn't have to pretend to be somebody else's idea of what their voice should be where they, they really needed to have, where there was no continuous, uh, I call it stones across the river, step-by-step -step opportunity to move your voice forward without compromise. And that the notion, you know, eventually this fellowship idea was one of a number of, of, of things we thought needed to happen in order to create a coherent net in which the folks we really cared about, the artists we really cared about could, could feel buoyed and that they could actually travel from theater to theater in a deliberate way, uh, and that they could have different kinds of perspectives to bounce their ideas off of, so it didn't have to be about pleasing one. 
Yeah, and I remember uh, at Golden Thread, we had just started commissioning new work. I think our first commission was in 2005. And what we understood from that process was how how much more resources uh, a development process requires. And as a producing company and a small you know, company with limited resources, um, I was very, very aware of um, how, for example, a two year development process at the Lark could really be life changing for a playwright and for a play. And I was uh, really drawn to this idea of making that possible um, through, through a partnership. Uh, Jamil, how was it? How was it for you? What do you? Well, you know, I think there was so much excitement around <clears throat> the sort of creation of of uh, community, and you know, building on what what John had said, this idea that so many of us are not even supposed to like each other, uh, <laughs> uh, let alone create together and and share a space um, where stories are being exchanged and heard and. Uh, and, and received across what are oftentimes uh, perceived or real, very real barriers. Um, and and to, to me, that, that kind of energy um, and that kind of possibility was, was particularly exciting. Um, and also, you know, uh, to your point, Taranj, the opportunity to um, attach ourselves, connect ourselves with an institution like the LARC um, that was dedicated 24-7 to, you know, developing new voices and new plays and, and so forth and to draw upon that expertise uh, and those relationships. I, I, I remember those early years as a time of a lot of discovery um, and we were just all meeting each other and, you know, we were getting to know the respective voices and, and who was telling what stories how. And there was so much personal growth and artistic growth, and I think organizational growth that was, you know, really um, uh, accelerated by the opportunity to work, um, you know, in tandem, in collaboration. And also because we consider Chicago to be an inland coast, uh, this idea mm -hmm. of a tri coastal um, a partnership and that we, we really were reaching across America. Um, and, and speaking of, of diasporic communities in a, in a very broad sense uh, was also very invigorating. So how did it work? Did you have, did people apply for the fellowship or how did the inception of the idea or did you call on people to, to come forward? Because um, I actually don't know. Uh, in, initially, uh, I mean, initially it was, um, I mean, people did apply and, and they proposed a play that hadn't been written yet. So it was just, we just went on the idea and the, you know, their passion for telling that story. Um, so, so yes, so people, so playwrights applied and then we, we had a selection committee, yes? There was a selection committee. Uh, the LARC ran the whole process. So uh, maybe John can speak to it more. Yeah, you know, it, that part was complicated because we'd been doing a lot of other selection processes, but the challenge with selection processes is you don't want, the, you don't want to just automatically decide what a committee should look like or what a process should look like because some of the, the convenings that we, because we really committed ourselves to a series of convenings over the course of this fellowship and before that, and a lot of that just had to do with what were the challenges in the, the field, you know, were institutions willing to take risks? Were, and so a lot of those questions that came up, you know, were, were Middle Eastern diaspora writers, people who could write, even feeling incentivized to write because there were or were not opportunities uh, that, that um, uh, if you actually got a chance to share something and you only had a reading, but you didn't have the opportunity to become a better writer by working on that piece with colleagues, why would you continue? So a lot of, we made lists and lists of what the, the environmental challenges were. And that 
came back to the questions of the selection process. So the selection mm -hmm. process involved a committee that involved the three of us. Um, uh, eventually, I think it involved some of the, the, the previous fellows so that they could actually give us information about what their fellowship had provided to them and what we wanted to look for. Um, but there was a lot of outreach uh, into communities uh, at Golden Thread and Silk Road because those two organizations had spent you know, quite a number of years sort of focusing on those things. So there was a, a focus on the purpose, you know, what we were looking for and communicating that to people who might or might not be willing, you know, to consider making a submission. Uh, and there were, um, uh, uh, there was a question of, of outreach and were we reaching those writers? There was a question of essentially how was the program itself going to function over two years and would the writers who we gave the award to be willing to commit to showing up in three parts of the country and committing to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to put those writers in, in a compromised position of not giving them enough money and enough resources to do that. So they felt as though they were essentially show ponies for mm -hmm. a program. We were really trying to create a program that was really going to buoy uh, these, these folks up. And we felt three parts of the country doing that together would begin to uh, uh, connect to other organizations, which I think it eventually did. But this is a long winded way of talking about how the selection process as it evolved every other year, because it was a two year fellowship uh, and we did it in three cycles, how that selection process evolved. It looked like a lot of selection processes, a lot of organizations, but also uh, different because I think that the, the purposes were so clear. That's just a reminder of all the legwork and time it takes to, to bolster and buoy these processes. You know, it's just, I don't know, that people know that about how work evolves. Um, I just wanted to take a minute though to show when he's gonna show the three images of the artists, the fellows who, who eventually were commissioned to do these projects. This is Adriana von Nichols, right? Who, who um, wrote- He was the first, Isis. yeah. He was the very first one. And so we'll show a few clips later from, from that. And it's interesting because uh... Yeah, and this is, this, is, Mona and this is Mona Mansour, who's actually a third commission. And and we swim, we talk, and this is Yusuf El Gindi, our beloved, my beloved Egyptian, you know, co <laughs> in the world, who I who I adore. And we'll get to more detail and sort of digging into each project separately. But Taranj, you were saying something. You're saying it's interesting. Uh, well, I was just reminded that in the process of defining the selection um, selection process and the goals of the program, it was an opportunity to also revisit the term Middle East, which is so problematic for so many of us. <laughs> and yet we continue to sort of like baggage, drag it along with us, you know. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's interesting that our first uh, awardee, our first playwright was Armenian. And we felt that that reflected well on the fact that we're committed to a broad and inclusive mm -hmm. definition of the Middle East. Um, and that her, her project, Night Over Zynga, was really um, a process of self-discovery, right? And reconnecting with a family history that she had sort of um, hadn't hadn't explored uh, for, for, for many years. Um, yeah, so I was just reminded of, of, again, you know, this definition of the Middle East, which is always so challenging. And, and the fact that she's of mixed heritage, Armenian mm -hmm. and, and Dominican, which is in many respects representative of, of a majority of people of Middle Eastern or Southwest Asian heritage uh, in this country. Yeah. You know, also, also, she was an actor who had created a one-person show that was quite successful around the 9-11, her 9-11 experience. And this, in fact, was such an incredibly interesting response to one of the criteria, which was how do we encourage people to move into the area of authorship, into, into writing, into becoming playwrights and authors. This was her first full-length play. Uh, and that required a, a lot of support support because nobody wanted to tell her how to write a play. She knew how to, she knew how plays work. She was in them, you know, understood it in her bones. But, but um, it was interesting because 
there weren't actually a, like the senior states person in this community in a lot of ways was Yusuf. Uh, so it's interesting to go from her and then to Yusuf who um, had so much more experience and then to Mona. So, so the resources were, were slim in a sense because I think we could have served 50 people in this way if we'd had the resources and the, the time. And so because she, and she was the first project and actually the one of the three that has gone to all three companies, right? It's you each experienced working with that play pretty deeply. So can you uh, just clarify for me the, that that portion in the LARC, how long of a phase was that, that she was working with you guys? Well, I don't, you know, we have these kind of diagrams like this, that are sort of, you know, which is to say that, that, that we designed it so that it wasn't necessarily, you go here, you know, and then you, you know, you, and then you go to the next place and then you go to the next place. We, we tried to keep in conversation throughout. And so I, I re recall that, and I don't have the, the calendars here with me, but I do recall that that she spent time with us, but then she spent time with the three of us. And then she spent time uh, at one of the other theaters and then one of the other theaters. And so to a certain degree, when there was the need for a, a, a development event, you know, when I say that, I mean a round table or a, a week long workshop, etc. We designed it so that it would happen in our different communities. And while we were working with her on the play and her collaborators, we were also working in the local community in terms of creating a conversation around what this work meant to them. So there were, there, we have a few images from the workshop at the Lark that Wendy will share with us. Um, so just for my mind, were those, that was the first sort of public event. Is that correct? Yeah. This is the bare bones production, which is essentially a, a non-reviewed note. You can see it's all modular furniture. Um, we're rehearsed, fully rehearsed. In fact, the whole cast spent a lot of time, you know, at an Armenian church and eating Armenian food together. Um, ah. So it was very, you know, uh, a lot of the staff had come from that background. So there was a lot of, um, of sort of absorption of community and connection to those kinds of things. Uh, and there's, a, you know, there's that whole cultural question of what it means to be Armenian in America is a whole other side to this. We're talking right now just about the process for the artists. But this, there were round tables before this and, you know, week long retreats. This was, um, you know, I think it was a four week long rehearsal period and eight or so performances. Oh, great. That's, that's that's quite a lot for a workshop, actually. That's rich. Yeah. I think I think as a performer, that sounds like a real experience. And so then now it would be lovely to segue into the first, a little a clip from the first production, which is that yeah. Before we watch the first clip, yeah. I just want to build on what John was talking about okay. connecting with community because what the extended development process, the opportunity that it gave us was to actually cultivate community around the play yeah. uh, and, and introduce the playwright to the community well in advance of the production so that community members could actually participate in the development process and watch the play grow. <clears throat> so in San Francisco, like the, you know, Adriana received the award in 2008 and the San Francisco production was in 2011. So we had three years uh, where we reached out to the local Armenian community in the Bay Area and built excitement around this production. And when Adriana was here for the first stage reading, we had a full house uh, of enthusiastic supporters from the community who couldn't wait for this play uh, to be, you know, fully developed and staged. So. Uh, and, you know, they invested in the production financially, they invested in the production by sharing their own family stories. And, and I think even, you know, helping Adriana find contacts and connections in Armenia and, uh, and all of that. So it was really an amazing uh, process. And, you know, I, I want to add to that, I mean, working with the local Chicago Armenian community and really getting to know the 
the, the lay of the land in terms of you know institutions and churches. Um, but we also attempted um, to work with the Turkish community and to bring you know Turkish people. So at an official level, that did not go over very well, and there was pushback and um, uh, and you know people who wouldn't engage us. But on an individual level. Uh, there was certainly some success, and uh, individual, uh, you know, Turkish Americans coming to the play and wanting to talk about the issue of um, uh, of genocide and 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 just you know the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman legacy, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in general. So I I I do think that some relationships were developed. Um, out of this process that may not have or probably wouldn't have uh, had it not been around a piece of art that I think so beautifully and so effectively invited people in um, and uh, allowed people to find themselves in the story. There was also an Armenian production, you know, in mixed. Yes, in, in Armenia. Yes. Oh. oh, there was. I didn't realize which, that. Which we didn't get to go to see, which I'm very disappointed about. Did someone, the revival. Was it, was there, a, who translated it? Somebody in Armenia or? No, I think it was someone, an Armenian in New Jersey who, who had seen ah. the production. Uh, I don't know if it was the Chicago production or the San Francisco production, but then they reached out to Audrey Anna and, and translated the play and produced it in Armenia. What yeah. a rich experience. Say, the, the play that put us at the Lark on the map on a certain level before we really committed to development, we did productions and it was a Turkish, it was by a Turkish American writer, Sinan right. Anel. And so we had made all of these connections within the Turkish community. And when we made this deep multi-year commitment to this Armenian writer, it actually, you know, every time as, as a community, you hold everybody together, you know, it, you don't just have, frankly, Black History Month, and you know you don't try to to create uh, silos, but you actually find a slow and deliberate way to have human conversations. It was, I think, it was fascinating uh, to our community to actually have to grapple with the complexities of that history within the context of actually making art that mattered to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, yeah, Jimmy Liu coined the term culinary diplomacy. When you talked about a conversation I had with you and Catherine Corey, I think of artistic and culinary diplomacy, and how and how how it hold, can hold space for so many people. It's, it's incredibly important. So I'd love to move to these clips. So we'll watch first the one from Golden Thread. Taranj, could you just set the sort of contextual stage of when? Yeah, the, and I want to suggest, in the interest of time, that we just watch one minute of each video. Okay, if that's okay with Jamil. Um, yeah, so this is our uh, uh, world premiere in San Francisco in 2011. It was at um, the Southside Theater um, uh, or the Magic. in Fort Mason <clears throat> at the Magic. Um, <clears throat> and what's interesting is that while the lead actor throughout development and production in San Francisco remained the same, we did have a director change. So Daniela had directed uh, the development process of the play and was you know, slated to direct the San Francisco production, but then she got another offer. And so we had to make kind of a last minute adjustment. Uh, and we brought in Hafiz Karamali to direct um, our production in San Francisco. And one of the things that was really striking um, about the production is its scenic design and lighting design and the music, which it just like transports you to these various spaces. Cause the play spans what 40, 50 years, three generations from Armenia uh, to the US um, from Adriana's grandmother to her, to her mother. And, and so it's, um, you know, it was, it's a massive story. And I think the design team here really did, did an amazing job of uh, creating a space that, that, that could contain, uh, in a way contain and free that story simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. So we'll watch that clip first. Here we go. Mm. 
Beautiful, beautiful. See, I didn't get to see it because I was probably nursing a newborn. That's so beautiful. I feel like I have a sense of the landscape of the the whole thing through watching that. Yeah, great. It's simply about memory and and yeah. trauma and 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 apprehending trauma uh, and and finding some path to healing. And you can see that in the in in the way you know in the fairy tale uh, look of it in a certain way. John, did you get to see both productions? Yes. Okay. That was, part, then, that, was part, that was part of the point, and I think it's actually very important to, to writers, is to be able to have, for long periods of time, peers, colleagues, to talk about the work. Not, you know, that it's good or bad, but, but what was most successful in each step of the process. Yeah. And so the second clip is from Silk Road's production, which was, what? when was it, Jimmy? Do you remember? So we, we followed uh, Golden Threads. So I, I uh, this is terrible. I want to say 2012. Uh, yes, it wasn't 2012. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I knew that question was coming and I'm like, I, I believe it was a year. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So this, this clip is, um, is I think is the past, right? Is, the, is what we're calling the yeah. Okay. And, and really, yeah. And to this, to what to what John just said about essentially inherited memory and inherited trauma, and how that becomes, um, and how difficult it becomes to move on, you know, without any sort of of, of redress, and also you know the fact that for so many survivors, they were surviving in a type of isolation. Um, and they were running up against the dictates of, of American assimilation and, you know, sort of leaving behind what you left behind um, and how ultimately, you know, that is impossible. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Now, Geek, quiet, I said! You wash those hands, all that filth you dragged in here! And when you are finished, you come in here and set the table. Set everything around here. Quiet! I can hear you all the way down the street. How nice of you to come home! How nice of you to drink! and laugh and smoke at the club with your friends while I clean your house, feed your child, cook your dinner, and sign all the orders for your damn tea Alice, house. Alice, please, please. Alice, please, please what? Please don't tell you how I feel. It was a very bad day today in the stock market. It was a very bad day at home. Agig, set the table! The doctor said I should rest. And he said, I am here working myself oh, to the I home. I told you, ask Mrs. Pistorian for help. I don't want the help of a neighbor. I want my husband oh. to care enough to help. That was a great clip, by the way. That that It's sort of a little bit like a, a Hollywood uh, award show clip. <laughs> I know. I was going to... It's well filmed. Yeah. I, it's a well filmed. It's Sometimes I find watching theater on video painful but that was actually really beautiful the close-ups you know, the, per the per perspective from below yeah mm -hmm. thank you for mm -hmm. that thank you for that. i feel like we we could spend so much more time talking about that piece but in the interest of time i'm going to segue i feel like that was a very full conversation i i've learned a lot and so now we're going to move to the second commission which was 
Yusuf's. And that was the mummy in the revolution from which we have one image, um, which I believe is from the workshop at the Lark and that Wendy will share with us momentarily. But I would love to hear about what happened there, about you know the commission and, and the piece in general, why it wasn't fully produced and all that. So maybe John, you wanna talk about this this moment, I'm not sure you could start. We'll, 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 we'll all pitch in, you know, Yusuf, was our second uh, fellow recipient. And Yusuf had um, a, a career at, uh, already, as opposed to Adriana, who was sort of, uh, you know, starting in her writing career. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was the very first play that Yusuf recommended was not this play at all. It was a much darker, <laughs> difficult, um, serious, play and we did the reading of that first i think uh and then he said but you know i'm writing this other play he said i always write two plays at the same time one happy and one sad uh because otherwise i don't know where i am and and you know in the meantime we'd worked with him on three or four other plays maybe four before then uh and i know that he'd spent a lot of time with each of you guys um but but it was it was interesting because we became um less of a platform to have to deliberately launch a particular production of a play because my real interest is in is in the, the the writers as visionaries as platforms themselves for ways of thinking of the world and so really yusuf was working on many plays at the same time around the country at that time and we were just in you know the mummy and the revolution is a farce uh about the uh the essentially about the arab spring you guys can pitch in on, on talking a little mm -hmm. bit about what it was. But but and Giovanna Sardelli, who's a director who's worked on a lot of, you know, very funny stuff. A lot of what we worked on there, he was working on there, which was a little bit like uh, what was the other play you were mentioning before Taraj? Um uh the Ho the Hollywood play that he wrote. Just he's very he was he was very interested John Jones. in humor. <clears throat> exactly. Uh, and so a lot of what we spent our time doing was just creating a community for him and the emphasis on having to move to that work to production because he was already seeing productions was was really more on on his personal development of the things he wanted to work on as an artist. And how did that so how did the two companies Silk Road and, and Golden Thread help support that? that process as well. Yeah, we did a stage reading of the first play. I'm now reminded that we did a stage reading of it uh, and had a, and I think Jamil, you were, I think, I don't know if Jamil and John were both there, but I remember an extensive discussion afterwards and kind of the desire uh, for something different. It, it um, and, that's when Yusef said, well, I have this other play. It's actually more timely because it's directly, it's happening uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring and it deals with um, uh, Egyptian antiquities being smuggled and, and it's a farce and, uh, you know, there's a mummy, you know, and whenever there's a mummy, I mean, my God. So strong so. No, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> when he when he kind of offered this other story and this other play, what what's striking about the play is that its its production needs are extensive. Um, and I remember telling him, you know, this is beyond Golden Thread's ability, you know. Uh, and he said, "Well, thank you for." Um, you know, giving me the opportunity to write a play that you can't produce. <laughs> and, and I said, well, you know, if that's what you need and if that's what, uh, you know, the, the, like this moment calls for, uh, that's fine. We ended up doing a stage reading of excerpts of The Mummy and the Revolution at one of our Reorient festivals. And, uh, uh, you know, and we kind of left it at that. And I, I would actually love to see a production of that play because it's mm -hmm. a, it's a very fun and uh, humorous take on, uh, you know, theft and betrayal and political corruption. I, I mean, ditto to what Taranj just said about the production needs and the design needs, and um, and I, I too would love to see. You know, a fully produced um, version of, of a 
of the mummy. We were kind of marketing our staged reading as, or staged readings, I think it was a weekend of staged readings, as Abbott and Costello meet the Arab Spring. Um, so <laughs> that, that seemed to work uh, for, for audiences. And it is, it is such a, it's a smart piece. It's a, it's a funny piece. Um, and, you know, we have all this, this sort of, you know, sadness and horror associated with the destruction of antiquity and the looting of antiquity and, uh, and so forth, particularly in, you know, the past decade. And, you know, he's able to frame the conversation um, within a very political context, but also a very human and, and relational uh, context and, and one that allows us to um, really think about the value and the meaning that we ascribe to antiquity and to history and, um, and to some of the treachery in the, uh, in the antiquity business. So, you know, just, just the opportunity to, to be in a room <laughs> <laughs> with Yusuf al Gindi and and to hear his words and to watch his process um, is is always such a gift. Um, and to, to, to us, this was um, no, it was never fully realized as as a production, but we got to be part of a process and and a journey. And um, uh, and and Yusuf is always working those muscles, you know, and he's always looking for new new language and new landscapes uh, to tell to tell his stories in ways that only he can uh, mm -hmm. and and I think <laughs> I think mummy is is very representative of um, uh, of, of just his complexity uh, his inner complexity and then what you know what he brings to the page and the stage and you know I'm still advocating for that you know now that I'm emeritus at the lark I have I'm, I'm, I'm just recalling so many plays that, that you know, so many plays don't find the exact right opportunity. And it's so interesting because he really knows British farce. He grew up to a certain degree in the UK. And this is kind of noises off. And I remember how many theaters I've worked at that all they wanted to do was to produce noises off, but they didn't have enough height for a big double door <laughs> slam. And that's what this is. And actually, you know, in a certain way, one of the values of taking the time for all of us to work on it with him is that sometimes Sometimes work that is culturally explicit or that is focused on representation becomes very family oriented or very psychological. And what was so extraordinary was to actually go into a different kind of more broadly comic structured kind of art form to sort of explore many of those issues. And I would ask my peers, by the way, you know, because he had a different experience, say, than Adriana or even Mona. Um, uh, you know, I think that he, I think that uh, in my conversations with him, he's very polite. I think he got quite a lot out of the fellowship, you know, besides the support. And I, but one of the things I know we got out of it was we, at that time during his presence, was a time when we were doing a lot of outreach to artists in the community, trying to get them to be on Facebook groups. And he was a real leader on a certain level in bringing that community together to sort of really shine a light on a, a whole set of voices that weren't being, weren't being featured. But if you guys may, might, might have a thought about, you know, what, what that different kind of fellowship meant to a person. Well, I remember, um, you know, it kind of instigated a conversation around what are some other ways that we can support a playwright's career. And we talked about publications. We talked about partnering with larger theater companies for on a production. And we also talked about, you know, uh, Jamil, do you remember this? We've, we've talked about, uh, simultaneous production of Yusuf El Gindi plays at Silk Road and Golden Thread, which is still something we want to do at some point. But, you know, just what are some other ways that we can support the careers of, uh, of playwrights? And it's important to remember that it's not just about a production, it's actually about, you know, a lifetime of creativity and, and storytelling. So, uh, that's, I think that's what the program is dedicated to. And I think that that's all what all three of us are dedicated to supporting. It also sounds very liberating for artistry, right? That you have this opportunity to not worry about pragmatic issues, like how am I gonna put this very wacky idea on stage, but I can just release this, this aspect of the story and, and a way I wanna tell it with all the support, it, it sounds, very liberating. 
Yeah, okay. the okay. other completely unpractical, I mean, Mona's play, you know, it's all about a conversation in the Pacific Ocean. And from the time we read the, <laughs> we read the proposal, we're like, okay, and how is this going to be staged? <laughs> so That's what makes it art. I mean, in that solution, I mean, I've, yeah, I just love that piece. And so we're segueing now to talk about the third commission, which is one of Mansour's play, We Swim, We Talk, We Go to War. And um, we had that one image that showed up earlier, which is uh, from the workshop. It's one of actually such a beautiful picture of um, Mona and Evren talking, I think was at the Lark and, and their relationship and collaborative artistry is, is really rich. Um, I find the way they communicate. So, so again, this seems like it started really sort of you you worked richly with it at the Lark, and then it. So, what you guys talk? I want to stop talking. <laughs> well, the, this this um, the Mona received the MEA at a time when suddenly her career boomed, and she received a number of other commissions and opportunities. And so the development of We Swim uh, was a little delayed in terms of process. Um, and I think my take, I mean, Mona probably has a different take on this, but I also felt that the story was very personal and very difficult for her to tell. And so, um, I don't know, maybe she just kind of <laughs> put it on the back burner uh, when she could. But once she sat down and started writing, my God, I mean, uh, it just, I don't know, just flowed uh, out of her. And, and she was, um, you know, both creative in terms of how she wanted to tell the story and, and keeping the humor and the and her own a kind of exposing her own vulnerability because it's the story is about a conversation she had with her nephew uh, about war um, and, uh, and it has impacted uh, her relationship with her nephew and her family. And, and so she was sort of working through all of that as she was writing uh, this play. Uh, and I think, you know, I really was very impressed by how open she was to telling the story and, and examining uh, some of those sort of difficult moments and difficult nuances of, of you know, family relationships when we are in disagreement, political disagreement with people we absolutely adore um, and how do we manage that? So uh, yeah, I, I have uh, great memories of both the readings um, of that of that play remember john the first time she gave us five pages of the play to read and we did a quick reading during uh one of reorient festivals that you were able to attend and and then we had this amazing conversation afterwards um so yeah so it's just you know small steps over uh, the course of a number of years um and then really diving into the development process and and Mona was lucky because she was able to work with Evren from the very beginning. So they partnered on this uh, production. And, and I think Evren was uh, instrumental in, in um, helping her sort of visualize how it could be staged. Yeah. You know, it's such a play for the Trump years in, in many <laughs> respects, because you know, we, we talk about this that we're at a place in our polarization i mean hopefully this is diffusing some but um where people could not speak across uh ideological lines and and it really was i mean i was reading an article a few months ago about the extent to which family relationships were really damaged by you know what we had just uh experienced and and this play that the fact that they don't walk away the fact that they don't you know, unfriend or block each other or whatever one can do, you know, in these sort of online mediums. Um, but they are literally in an ocean swimming together and processing and unpacking. Um, and uh, 
and that the relationship and the love they have for one another and the respect they have for one another and the familial bonds um, won't be frayed, you know? I mean, it'll be challenged, it'll be tried and tested and all of that. Um, but uh, I, I, I think she, I think you can take this play and put it in any number of, drop it in any number of conversations and it, it, um, it, it lives in a very vibrant and, and effective way. So it's testimony to, to, to Mona's writing um, and, and also as, as Teron said, to, to just her courage um, to, uh, to, to take these kind of risks. So we, we did a staged reading of, of the play um, that also I think was really well received and we had uh, wonderful talkbacks. Once again, I don't remember if it was two or three readings we would tend to do you know, across a weekend. Um, and uh, someone in, 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 well, my dentist uh, <laughs> has, has much more um, conservative politics than, than I have, let's say. And, uh, uh, and she comes to everything we see. She comes to our readings, she comes to our productions. She's, you know, she's a, big, a big support, but she has referenced, uh, we go, we swim, we, 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 I'm sorry, we swim, we talk, we go to war um, several times uh, over the past few years and just how angry it made her. And, uh, and she, she will still repeat different lines and different, so clearly it had, <laughs> It had quite quite an impact. I say this with all due respect. I I am very fond of my dentist, um, but we think differently. <laughs> that's a lot of resonance, though. I mean, when a piece yeah. lands like that for someone, that's amazing. I, so now is a good time to show the clip that we have from that piece. Uh, I'm, I feel lucky I was there that night when the majority of Mona's family came. Her father came and her brother, and so yeah. And I said, uh, I said, every soldier has blood on his hands, every one of them. Whoa. You still think that? I do. And then what did my mom say? What did she say back to you? Oh, I'm asking. I deserve to know. She said, uh, she said, he's going off to war. He will be deployed soon, and he's, he's already doubting it all a little bit. You know, you, you cannot say those things to him, you understand? You cannot say anything that's going to create doubt in his mind, because if you do, you are um, putting his life in danger. And she was right. I mean, I know she was right. I mean, you're my nephew. You're not my kid. You know, I don't have kids. And, and I, I can't imagine what it's like to, to know your kid is going off to war. Were you trying? Mm. Mm. I just uh, I got very emotional watching that little piece right there. Yeah. 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 And yeah. what was beautiful about uh, the scenic design for this piece was if you noticed in the background, it's a chalkboard that is, uh, what is it, convex chalkboard upstage. I um, loved it then. Yeah. And so the play begins by uh, engaging the audience in this conversation around war. And we, uh, at Golden Thread, we have this, you know, process that we're committed to called deeper dialogues, where we, um, you know, sort of identify the themes of the play, and with the with an eye on making the themes of the play personal for our audience, so that it's not about you know, the Middle East is far away place, but really about their personal relationship. So uh, generally we would have a uh, interactive lobby display where we pose a question to sort of prime the audience um, 
to experience the play from a personal perspective. And for this play, it was how has war impacted you or your family personally? And instead of having the interaction take place in the lobby, we actually used the chalkboard um, and invited the audience after the play to get on stage and, and write their thoughts. And then we photographed it each night and the image that you saw contained some of the, um, some of the feedback from the audience. And Mona was so moved by this uh, activity that she actually wrote it into the end of the play um, as something that was done at Golden Thread that she would love to see at other productions. Yeah, I loved how it created a visual landscape at the end of 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 impact to me, mm -hmm. and it was it was like it was very poetic. Actually, it was very impressionable and a reminder for the ways it can layer in connection and performance. I thought it was mm -hmm. a wonderful idea. In the interest of time, I could go on talking more and more about this, but we don't have much time left together. So I would love to just pose this question, which is what next? What's in the future for this relationship? Does it, yeah, simple. Well, I, I just want to say that in addition to considering uh, Taranj and John to be friends and, and collaborators and co-conspirators, uh, I, I also consider them to be teachers. Um, and I have just learned so much from these relationships and I continue to learn and I look forward to, uh, to learning more. And I think that the learning curve that we've all been uh, a part of has been um, revelatory and, uh, and, and, and beautiful and just so empowering. Uh, it's easy as a producer to feel, um, you know, like you're you're stuck in a cave somewhere, <laughs> uh, and 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 you're on a, a, a you know the, the the gerbil wheel of of productions and, and 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 grants and this and that and the other thing. But the opportunity to be in conversation with with John and Tranj over all these years has been. Um, uh, an extraordinary gift. So I, I want to express my gratitude uh, and just looking forward to, um, to, to the next stages that I don't know we've, we've necessarily defined, but we know we are, we are um, in community and we are working together uh, towards shared goals. You know, community was so disconnected compared to now when you know, in 2006 and in 2001, you know, uh, that, that, that it's astounding to look at the kinds of relationships, not only among producers, writers, directors, actors, uh, but, but, but the, the difference in perception that they all have about the field and society. I mean, there was such a sense of marginalization at those early conversations, you know, and I have to just say something about the, the language we talk about all the, you know, there's a piece of language I hate, the, the language of risk and the language of the field. And, and, you know, just because in a way the field becomes this contained, this thing we think we can control in the world that defines how we're going to do things to make art happen. And, and that's deeply connected to risk, which has to do with our perception of what, of what will blow our cover, what will, what will, um, you know, what we're scared of. So I just, I just feel as though the what we've done by being patient um, and appreciative of each other, and by bringing the, these fellows have not just become people who we were able to support as part of the fabric of their careers, but they've come in to be part of our companies. And, and in a certain way, so many projects have been generated from this kind of woven fabric of what we've created uh, that, that, that are happening all over the place that, that sometimes you just have to step aside and watch those things as they happen. I mean, I'm, 
excited about continuing in conversation with these two collaborators and with the three fellows we had and with the, I've, I've printed out lists and lists of people who showed up to have conversations, many of whom didn't know each other before uh, and, and now are, are part of a, a larger conversation that is not just about what we think of as the Middle East diaspora community, but, but how that connects to so many other parts of American and global society. So, I, you know, I, I feel as though the three of us are not just coming together because we've been invited to have a little, you know, memory lane conversation, but because we actually talk to each other quite frequently. And we like each other. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I think it, it, it's really, um, I don't know, mind blowing to think about, you know, back in 2005, 2006, in those convenings, the artists actually questioned their right to tell their stories you know, whether they had the right or the skills to represent their community um, fully or in the way that it needed to be represented. And today we have, you know, MENA Theater Makers Alliance, which is the first uh, national advocacy organization for our, you know, theater makers of Middle Eastern heritage. So we've come, we've come a long way. We've, we've, um, I think we are claiming uh, space uh, for our for our narratives on American stage in a way that we haven't before, and of course, you know, I think American theater is changing, and 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 you know, I'm also interested in sort of observing where these changes are going to take us. But as a playwright, um, you know, I'm also interested in making sure that uh, development support, production support continues to exist for, uh, for playwrights because, you know, we are the storytellers and without the stories, um, there isn't much else <laughs> that, can, that can happen on stage, right? So we need our playwrights to be supported um, and we need a, a diversity of stories to be told. You know, we need to sort of push the boundaries of how we define Middle Eastern American or Middle Eastern to include all kinds of uh, all kinds of stories that uh, that haven't been told yet. And I would venture to say there's a broader appetite for these kinds of stories uh, as a consequence of. <laughs> politics of the last 20 years, and I think also as a consequence of the investment that we and others have made in people don't just turn overnight into, into a person with all of the skills of telling a story. They need time yeah. and support to be who they truly are. And I think the world is ready for this in a way that it wasn't before. So whatever comes in the future is going to be much more about connecting different kinds of people to different kinds of ideas. Don't you remember back then? Lots, all those theater companies would just sort of say, "Why would we produce this? Nobody would yeah. come." Yeah, right. And you know, when there are dozens of stories, when there are hundreds of stories, um, no one artist or one company carries this burden of representation, and it allows us to play with genre and and style and theme and uh, perspective. Uh, in, in ways that in those earlier years, I think people felt very constricted and they felt um, policed in a certain way because everyone was having to respond to news cycles and, you know, um, about, you know, a, a terrorist event or this, that or the other and, uh, and, and contextualize and explain and, um, and, and I want us to move beyond that. I want us to move beyond this um, what I call react and respond, you know, that you're sort of, uh, and, and, and be at a place where we can um, really interrogate our own truths and our own, uh, our own experiences in, in a way that, that feels right. I wanna thank you three, this has been really inspiring. And as always, it's a conversation, I didn't know how much I needed. I didn't, I wasn't aware of how much I needed it. So thank you all. And I want to just say that we've come to the end of our time together, and I'd like to thank HowlRound for hosting this live stream event. A recording of this session will be available on both HowlRound 
and Golden Threads websites. Uh, many thanks to our live stream technician, Wendy Reyes, and Christine for managing the live stream on Golden Threads Facebook page. And many thanks to all of you for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you for having us. Thank you.